All right. Hi, everybody. Uh, for anybody who doesn't know me, my name is uh, Brian McCullough. I'm the uh, meeting chair for the Royal Astronomical Society Ottawa Centre here, uh, running the, uh, the PowerPoint program for us tonight. Uh, Chris Heron, just off to my right here. Now that everybody knows my name, Brian, I'll take the one thing off my neck. I've got too many things hanging around my neck here. All right. A couple of uh, interesting things on the go. We've got a couple of news items, uh, a couple of interesting uh, little little talks for you. And uh, now the Frasers aren't here tonight. They normally have the uh, the coffee and uh, and drinks uh, in the back. Uh, but I brought some drinks down and some cookies. There's no coffee. And uh, Linda Meyer has uh, graciously uh, acquiesced to my request to uh, to uh, woman the booth as it were. All right? All right, in case you didn't know, it's August 1st. Here we go. Uh, breaking news, breaking news. All right, ready to roll? Has anybody seen this already? Has everybody seen this? Now, it's just interesting. I'm in the middle of, a, uh, of an intensive five-week uh, French course, and I just did a presentation uh, yesterday uh, for, uh, for my oral communication class. And what did I do it on? Is there life elsewhere in the universe? And I talked about specifically about uh, the Phoenix mission on Mars and also about uh, the possibility of, uh, of the seeds of life possibly could be found on, uh, in the methane lakes in, uh, on the moon Titan of Saturn. But anyway, uh, the Phoenix spacecraft on Mars, of course, had detected some ice uh, just under its uh, foot. And of course, that people have been thinking that it probably was, uh, probably was water ice, but they wanted to get it into its uh, little easy bake oven so they could test it and be 100% uh, sure that it was in fact water ice. Now, uh, they've known for about six years that there is probably water ice on the surface of Mars. And it was, uh, was it yesterday or the day before? Day before, yeah. day, day before yesterday. Uh, they had trouble, they, they, the Phoenix lander has a little scoop on it and it's like a kid's toy and just scoops up some dirt and pulls it into an oven and they heat it up and uh, they can examine the, uh, the gases coming off to see what the, uh, what the contents of the sample are. Uh, unfortunately with the, uh, with the ice mixed into it, everything got clogged up so it took them a little while to let things uh, dry out a little bit, let some of the, uh, let some of the water evaporate uh, before they could test it in the oven and lo and behold, uh, there it is, they've identified water on Mars. So where they have been examining the surface of Mars and seeing the, the features uh, where it certainly looked like uh, uh, water runoff uh, from, uh, from uh, river systems, well, this is, uh, I, think, I think we all know what the answer is uh, for certain now. All right? The 3D image we were looking at, was that the scoop? Oh, the th oh, that's right. Now, the 3D image that we had up on the, uh, on the screen there a few minutes ago, yes, that was, uh, that was fr uh, one of the scrapings left behind from the, uh, from the little scooper. Yes? The lander has four of those ovens. Right? Yeah. Lander has four ovens, that's right. And it's used two so far? I think it's just, yeah, I think it's just used two because it can only use the ovens uh, once, yeah. one time, because they be, obviously they become uh, contaminated. Yeah. Okay, let's go to the next one. Here. Oh. Well, I'm very happy to announce that we've gotten a nice sample into the Tiga ovens. When we first found this out yesterday, we were really pleased. There were champagne corks popping in the downlink room, and we just had a great time of it. It's something we've been waiting quite a while for. Uh, of course, we know the GRS on Mars Odyssey discovered this ice six years ago, but we've now finally touched it and tasted it. That's one thing that hasn't been done before. And I'd like to say, from my standpoint, it tastes very fine. I'm very glad to be in this position. Through this analysis, we also hope to be able to answer a question that goes beyond just finding water ice, but is this a habitable zone on Mars? A habitable zone meaning that we have periodic liquid water, not today, but over time, and we have the materials that are the basic ingredients for life forms. It'll be for a future mission to find if anybody's home in this environment, but we'll be finding that this is a place that needs to be searched for life forms uh, throughout the next uh, two months of our uh, approved mission. And the other thing too, the mission's been extended. Oh, the, and, that's, and that's the other aspect, the, the mission's been extended. What's the date of, do you remember? Uh, it's extended in December. September. Right? September. Another 30 to 60 days, if I recall. Yeah, so another 30 to 60 days on the mission, so another <laughs> phenomenally uh, successful mission uh, there. All right, let's hit the next one. Here we go. Uh, this is now we're looking at the, the uh, surface of the moon uh, Titan in the Saturn system, the Saturnian system. And uh, they've, now when, they, uh, when the, uh, the Huygens lander uh, left the uh, Cassini spacecraft and landed on the surface of, uh, of Titan, 
Uh, the, what's that, two years ago now? Something like that? I have no, no concept of time. Uh, they detected what they figured were lakes of, uh, of methane. And sure enough, now in the same, at the same time, they're confirming that the, uh, the lakes are, uh, are in fact uh, pools of liquid methane. So, of course, methane is uh, one of the, you could call it one of the primordial ingredient, ingredients uh, for, a, uh, for our life system. So I figure if they tap deep enough into those lakes, they're going to find some creepy little crawly thing that's going to be just fantastic. So, all right. <laughs> All right, let's go to the next one, please. I hope so. Okay, Tim. Tim will give us a, an idea of what's uh, coming up in the uh, skies for us this month. Stars, another 39 days of cloud. <laughs> Thank you. So it's not so. It's not so. I lied. Okay. Um, We've got a shadow transit of Io coming up at a really nice time on uh, on Hiroshima Day, actually. Um, I really shouldn't have, yeah, very bad taste, uh, which is kind of, anyway, never mind. If any of you haven't had a chance to see a shadow transit of Jupiter, Jupiter's nice, well, it's not beautifully placed for it because it's still a bit low in the sky as the finer chart there will show you, but a, a shadow transit's a lot of fun to watch. And this one's at a sensible hour, so if we can roll the animation of it, this will give you a sense of what we're looking at. Now, one of the fun parts with an IO shadow transit is that IO moves so fast. Uh, I forget its orbit, but it's under two days. And it moves so fast that you can watch the whole transit in a reasonable period of time. So, um, what we can see here, we've got, if I can ever find a switch on this little, there we go. There we go. There's Io just going off the moon, and there's a shadow being cast on the moon as well. And then as a freebie, you've got the great red spot showing up as well at the end of it all. So, um, Maybe we can run that a second time. Yeah, why don't we try that? So this is about uh, 30 times normal, my mistake, slip to zero, 300 times normal speed. But uh, if you watch these with Io, um, it, it is quite noticeable, and it, it actually is quite enjoyable to watch. And the nice part, too, is you can come back after uh, an hour and, uh, and, and really notice the difference. And, and can we show that a third time? And you'll see just at the uh, 2 o'clock at the two o'clock position, you'll see one of the other moons is just slipping behind uh, Jupiter. All right. We'll Good run point. that one more time, please. Thanks. It wants to finish. Oh, it wants to finish. Okay. Well, prima donnas. He's ready for see, his close-up. Yeah, oh, yeah, right. I forget which one this is. It might be Europa, but I can't recall for sure. Again, these things can be looked up. You don't have to cheat. Actually, looking up does help you cheat, but that's another story too. So anyway, good fun. Uh, you don't need a super huge telescope for this, but uh, certainly, I mean, binoculars won't cut it, and, and a little uh, four inch, you might find it kind of tough unless the conditions are perfect. A uh, nice big daub will do nicely. But uh, anyway, some good fun to be had with this one. So, um, now we have, uh, oh. Good, you're, not making, you're making me not have to lie here. Um, this is just another one of those lovely little Kodak moments. Uh, a whole bunch of planets in the evening sky. Uh, Venus will be the biggie. Um, Saturn, in fact, those are, those are backwards. Um, somebody changed my picture afterwards. <laughs> yes, ungrateful persons. Uh, <laughs> can, can Chris and I slip out now? Yes, yes. Well, I, I stopped them because they were going to use the old picture that didn't have Mars, and they were just going to put the arrow up anyway, thus forcing me to lie, and I was not going to be happy, which they really didn't care about, but at any rate. Um, so anyway, one of the nice things with this is it's a crack at Mercury, which is, you know, reputation has Mercury to be incredibly hard to find, which is a complete load of rubbish. It's not. But it is a little tricky because it's never very high. So it's nice if you have a signpost nearby and, and Venus, not Saturn, Venus makes a very nice little signpost. Mars, you're probably going to have a devil of the time finding. But anyway, there it is. Oh. <laughs> Brian and I are feeling guilty. <laughs> good, good. We have the technology. Now, could you change the color from putrid green? Anyway. I guess I shouldn't push it. Okay. So anyway, another little fun Kodak moment. And in case you didn't recognize the big bright thing a little bit off to the side, they've labeled it sun. So uh, do not look directly at that, by the way. 
I'm nervous to go to the next slide. <laughs> Give it a shot. And uh, one of the yeah, one of the fun things though is that Venus is becoming uh, more and more visible. So you have the great fun of watching Venus. For any of you who haven't had a ch who haven't taken some time to watch Venus over the space of a few weeks, it is fun because it, its parent disk size increases drastically. Uh, changes drastically, I should say, over the whole period that's view that is viewable, and the crescent is really quite noticeable. And the jury is out as to whether you can see the crescent shape with naked eye. Uh, there are people who claim they do it, but then again, there are people who claim that there are strange things happening. And never mind, forget it. But at any rate, um, but there's some fragmentary references from old histories that suggest uh, somebody may have seen the crescent. So give it a shot. Uh, Mercury, again, is going to be nice and viewable for a little while longer, so a good crack at it. So again, Kodak moment stuff, and unfortunately, this time of summer, uh, well, I mean, we're getting into some reasonable evening hours now when you can at least get something reasonably dark, but uh, the last couple of months, it's almost good it's been cloudy because it's very depressing. When it's not cloudy, it's still bright. So uh, the land of the midnight civil twilight. Anyway. I don't know if, I can't even remember if I have another, oh yes, right, the Perseid meteor showers, forgot to mention that, and of course it's nearly a full moon. Um, yeah, anyway. <laughs> However, the nice part is the moon is setting around midnight, and the uh, theoretical peak for the Perseids is uh, 2 o'clock in the morning, but uh, basically any time uh, up to midnight. Um, now there's a little... Can you explain the progenitor of that? Ah, uh, progenitor was, if I recall, swift tuttle. Now what happens with meteor showers, uh, in most cases it's comet, but there's one case that isn't, is when the comets come by the Earth, they have that beautiful big tail and they leave a huge pile of dust behind them. And what happens is that tail, the, the tail dust stays behind as a stream that the Earth will pass through on regular intervals every year. And as we're blasting into that stream, we're basically catching a whole pile of those dust particles that are blasting into the atmosphere. So the effect of this is it's like driving into the snowstorm. Uh, it gives us the illusion of all the shooting stars, all the meteors coming from a common point. And this is what we're showing here. So if you look at the definition of the Perseids or any other meteor shower, it's oh good, it, it, the, the radiant, the radiant thing must be there. I'm gonna look right there. And what you will find is you are sitting there looking at a big empty chunk of sky because that's not where you look. Um, basically, it takes a while for these to get up ahead of steam and, and make a nice little meteor. And they don't all happen at once. Think of this as, anyway, never mind, you get the idea. So basically, um, I've always been very successful with looking about 45 to 60 degrees away from the radiant. But basically, the Perseids are nice enough that if you basically go out, even to the city, if you can just hide yourself from lights, you're going to see a few more shooting stars than you normally would. And if you can find a nice dark sky, it truly is fun. Until the moon sets, it's going to be hard to see anything, but the moon is setting at, at a sensible hour. The only problem with this one is it is a Monday evening, so you will have to lie like crazy about why you can't come to work the next morning. Um, I can't come. My dog's sick. Um, you don't have a dog. Okay, it's the cat. Uh, anyway, never mind. So, great fun for meteor showers. Uh, do not. I'm sure most of us know this anyway, but don't bother with telescopes. Don't bother with uh, binoculars. It's a naked eye thing. What you need is a lawn chair and something to keep you warm. Trust me, it gets cold. And uh, mark one eyeballs. So uh, this is one of those beautiful ones that's fun for free. So anyway, uh, there is tons of other stuff in the sky. This is all the stuff that's super easy. All I'm trying to focus on with these is stuff that anybody can find with minimal preparation. Uh, there's lots of folks here that'll tell you the really snazzy stuff that will stretch your abilities, but this is all the stuff that you can, you know, grab the kids and, and go out for two minutes. So um, there's always something for somebody in astronomy, so go out and take a peek. Uh, Chris, thank you kindly for fixing your... Fixing my error. That's right, fixing your error and making me look wonderful. Making me look like a real nasty, you know, okay, fade individual. To fade to black. I'll leave now. Go on, go on. All right. As we can see, next up, uh, Bob Olson, all right, with a uh, uh, talk about his uh, observatory. Is, is, uh, ba is it a, well, it's not exactly a backyard observatory, is it? It's not backyard? Yeah, is it's it? the backyard. Oh, is it the backyard? Yeah, not here, though. Oh, uh, yeah, I know, I know. All right, Bob, go ahead. There's a pointer there. I got it. Oh, okay. So I'm loaded, ready for bear. Uh, this one is in Florida, much nicer than here. This is a view of my, uh, my, astro uh, my observatory in North Augusta. It's taken from my bedroom window. And uh, just a few things I'd like to show you here. Uh, the building itself is about 28, 28 by 24 feet, so it's a pretty big building. 
And this is my uh, concrete observing pad, which goes behind the building also. Uh, these, where's that pointer? <laughs> the, um, these poles I'll mention to you later, and this is an unused road allowance behind the, the building. Uh, open field, and then this is about uh, two miles of bush off in that direction to the, to the east. So I have a really nice dark sky where I am. Uh, Mount Olson Observatory was named by a friend of mine called Paul Shepard, a very sarcastic sense of humor, and because uh, this is the lowest spot in the area. <laughs> and you'll see that uh, it shortens down to moo. Now, uh, before I go much further about owning an observatory, I need to tell you that you have to be a little cautious about your neighbors. Uh, sitting out in the middle of the night with a telescope, uh, looking at things, uh, really uh, raises the suspicions of anybody who's not an observer, an astronomer. And uh, you uh, should really talk to your neighbors about what you're doing. And so I, they have come over and seen the telescope and see what I look at. And I used the line that my neighbors are all really ugly and I wouldn't look in their bedroom windows anyway. That wasn't as successful a strategy as I <laughs> first thought it might be. <laughs> this is the uh, observing pad from the back of the building. Uh, so my telescope set up in the back, and I roll it out onto this uh, pad here. And you'll notice the wheels on the, on the mount. And that's really the point of this, is this is a rollout uh, telescope observatory, rather than a set up one or drag out or roll off. Uh, and uh, there are some things about it that are good and some that are not so hot. Uh, this is my observatory from space. Uh, I got Chuck to fly up really high. <laughs> and he entered it in the, this is actually Google Earth. And that's my pad right there. And so you can see this big empty field and then forest. So it makes a fabulous uh, sky to the east and to the south. Uh, when I look to the north and to the west, I'm looking over buildings. It's only half a dozen or so buildings. Um, but they, they um, create, uh, in, the, uh, in the winter, they create heat waves. If I blow to the horizon, I look and open over roofs. And if I, in the summer, uh, the, the, the roofs are hot. So it's really, I don't observe to the west or the north much, unless it's really high in the sky. Oh, I want to show you one more thing. There's my observatory. See this road? Well, there it is from my observatory. <laughs> I had never stood in my backyard and looked out at, in the dark before I built the observatory. And then I set it up and put my telescope up, and there's these friggin' headlights aimed right at me, and they light you up like you're a prisoner being interrogated by the police. It's <laughs> unbelievably right. And they shine on you for about a mile. <laughs> so it's, it's just forever. So they have to be blocked. All right. So the solution was pretty simple. I went to an awning company, and they made me a big tarp. And that's what the poles are for. And that the tarp is in a bag, and you just roll it. I can put it up in two minutes. It clips to the top with bungee cords, and there is the road blocked. And it works like a dream. The black material is quite light proof, and uh, so it makes my, my sight very dark. Um, now, a couple of things. You can see the, the wheels on the, uh, the mount. And the, this is the box with all the electronics to run my, my telescope. I, I'm an imager rather than an observer, really. So I need to be able to run my filter wheels and my focusers and my telescope mount and my camera. It takes a ton of electronics, and that, they're in that supposedly waterproof box. When it rains, I found that it wasn't waterproof. But uh, that's another, another deal. Uh, you see the wires running back into my, sh into my observatory. And that's where I would control the telescope from. And uh, it takes two minutes to put the tarp up and five minutes to take it down. Taking it down is a bit of a nuisance, though, because if it's, it, there's always dew on it, so it's soaking wet. And in the winter, it gets the dew freezes. And so you have this big sheet covered with ice, and you're trying to stuff it in a bag. Uh, so I actually don't like to put that tarp, I don't, I'm sorry, I don't like to take it down. And you can't leave it up. So. Uh, what I do is I block it with a trailer if I'm imaging because you don't, all I need to do is block the headlights. Uh, this is no good if you're going to do visual, you need to put the tarp up, but if you're going to do uh, imaging, this is quite adequate. Uh, now, uh, you'll notice the wheels uh, down here are uh, the, the kind of wheels you find on power tools that if they're moving around in a shop to make your, make your tools mobile. 
you cannot observe with wheels on your tripod. It's just too unsteady. So the, the, the wheels have got to be retractable so you can uh, set the tripod back down on the ground. And that's what these ones here do. Okay, uh, two mounts there. One is my Elasmondi mount, which I use for visual, and then I have a, an astrophysics mount, which I use for uh, imaging. So which is which there? Uh, Mondi is here, and this is the astrophysics mount here. That's a, uh, a Celestron uh, 9 quarter inch telescope, and this is a Vixen 8 inch F5, uh, F4 uh, Newtonian, which I've just started using uh, for imaging. And here's the uh, foot pedals to run the wheels. Now, there is a, a bit of a problem with running a thing out in the, you know, onto an observing pad, and that is it's got to be polar aligned. So what I do is I've, I've drilled holes in the concrete, and I've actually lined the hole by driving in a little uh, pipe, so it's a steel lined hole. And then these bolts just line up with the hole, and uh, I do that on two of the arms. The third one just registers automatically. And uh, my, my mount stays perfectly polar aligned. It actually works very well for a long time. Um, and you can see there, it's just ready to drop it in the, in the hole. Uh, the painted on mark is because to find a quarter inch hole in the dark on a 16 foot by 12 foot pad is not all that easy. Uh, so I find it easily with the, with the, red, the, the black paint. Now, the pad actually does heave a bit in the, in the, in the, in the winter. So I do need to pull her line every once in a while. I pull her line three or four times a year just to check it. Usually it's fine, but sometimes it's a little bit. And pads are terrible for vibration. So if I'm doing imaging and I'm stomping around, it's gonna, I'm going to see it in my image. If I'm doing visual and I stomp around, I'm not going to see it. So for, for when I'm doing imaging, I've got to stay off the pad or tiptoe around. Uh, this is the uh, different kind of wheel. Exactly the same use. It came off a power tool, and I, it's on my Los Monde mount. Uh, this mount, by the way, came from uh, Attila Danko. <laughs> and Attila glued on hockey pucks <laughs> at the bottom of the mount. By the way, the levers give you about an inch and a half of travel, which is fine for uh, concrete. You certainly couldn't run it over a driveway easily, but uh, concrete is fine. Now, why a rollout observatory? You know, what, you know um, a, a pier with a building with a roll-off roof or a dome is certainly more convenient, and it's no more expensive than what I've done. So this is not a cheap solution unless you already have a garage you're going to run, the, uh, run it out of. But I fool with my telescope all the time. I'm always changing the scope or the filter wheel or the filters or the, the, just all the time. Camera, you know, just ch changing stuff all the time. And I've done that in other people's scopes. And you're cramped, you're dark, it's cold, you're getting eaten by bugs. Uh, working on your scope out in the open in an observatory is a pain in the neck. So uh, when I run it inside, it's easy. Nice and, it's an air-conditioned, heated building. So it's uh, easy to work on. All right. When I do run my scope outside, though, you know, you run it on the wheels and you step on the lever and the thing clunk, clunks down onto the ground. Uh, there's, it doesn't keep uh, synced to the sky. So uh, it'll vibrate a little bit out of sync. And so the scope doesn't exactly know where it is. So I then have to go out and visually, with a finder scope, find a bright star and then sync my scope to the sky. And it takes just seconds, I mean, because it's going to be almost on the star. So just a matter of giving the thing a little bump with your elbow and you're back, on, back in business. I, re I can go from inside to outside in about five minutes. I can be up and running in five minutes from when I decide to image. That doesn't mean that I can image in five minutes, though, because my scope is usually a different temperature than the environment. So then I have to wait for the scope to either be hotter, cool down, or warm up, depending which way uh, what the temperature is outside. Uh, this is a view from inside. Uh, this is my computer that I run everything with, and uh, you'll see the scope in the back, the background. Now, uh, I store my scope parked in a parallel, the, the, the scope is parallel, and the counterweight shaft is parallel to the ground. That allows me to get even a big scope out, out through the door. Uh, the first time I did that, I didn't, and I smacked it right into the door. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the button just stuck. 
<laughs> All right. Where was it? Right here. Sorry about that. So anyway, this is the scope looking inside. You can see the wire running into my, my computer inside. The scope is now looking northwest. Um, this is all closed up and it's very light tight. I've made a real effort to make sure that the inside lights don't come out to the outside. And that's, uh, I don't like to work in the dark, so that makes it really nice for uh, working on the computer. Now, the, the pier that I use uh, is a, a stainless steel 8 inch pipe and I bolted these aluminum blocks onto them and then I slipped the legs over that. It's an idea that uh, I stole from uh, Astrophysics in their portable pier. The problem was it's, they use an aluminum uh, pier and I'm using a stainless steel pier and a, a stainless rings a bit. It's little, got a little bit of spring to it. And so I had to put these reinforcing bars in to keep it from being too flexible. And uh, that worked fine. This is what it looks like uh, just before you slip the legs on. And then there's a cable that runs from here up to there which sort of holds the whole thing together. It's a, it's a great trick that uh, astrophysics came up with. Uh, this is my buddy Paul Shepard. Uh, we do a lot of visual uh, with Paul out there. Paul's a visual observer and I will observe uh, when, I'm, when I'm with, uh, let me put it this way, uh, astronomy to me is a social event if I'm doing visual and it's a solitary event if I'm doing imaging. So when friends come over we do, we do visual and uh, I have a nice dark site. Friends often come over so uh, Paul's probably the, the one that comes over the most often. Uh, this is Jim and Ann Baxter, just friends. They don't even like astronomy much. Uh, so they, uh, but they like looking at the bright, common things. So they, when they come over, we often roll the scope out if it's clear and take a look around. Now, this is a winter maintenance. <laughs> you know, the, this is when I wish I had a nice uh, dome. <laughs> you got like a foot of snow, and this winter, of course, we had hard, hardly any snow at all. No. Yeah, <laughs> and so, so you got to keep it clean, because if it's not clean, uh, then you uh, won't go out when it is uh, clear. So, you know, every time it snowed, I was out there with the snowblower, keeping it clean. And uh, it takes me about 10, 10 minutes to clean it off. I would snow blow it, and then I would uh, 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 shovel it with a push scoop. And then I actually use a, a squeegee on it to make it really nice and dry. Uh, now, let's just take a look again at my, my, my observing site. There I am right there. And this is a big open field with 10 foot high grass. And this is two miles of woods. Right? And I'm out in the dark. This is what it looks like from my observing pad in the dark. This uh, is sort of a spooky looking big field. And the wolves are there all the time. You hear them howling. The coyotes and the wolves are just howling all the time. I'm out in the country. And it, you know, it's, I normally don't have a flash on when I'm out imaging. It's quite dark. And uh, the wolves are there. <laughs> and, you know, they can, they can play with your mind. Uh, and then about, uh, actually, in a, about half a mile over in that direction there, there's a guy who has beehives. And the bears are there all the time knocking his beehives over. And actually, Paul Shepard, his son, ran over a bear about uh, five kilometers away from where my observatory is. And I want to tell you, if you have a choice between running over a raccoon or a bear, choose the raccoon. <laughs> All right? It did a lot of damage to the car. So there's bears. All right? And then I, there's always some idiot who reports that he's seen, they've seen a cougar mountain lion in the area. Uh, uh, I have my doubts. And then just recently there was a report that uh, the ministry has released six cougars in our area to eat the fishers which they released to eat the, rac to, to eat the porcupines. <laughs> Highly reliable sources, I'm sure. But in the middle of the night when you're tired, it plays on your mind. <laughs> and so, you know. And actually, the animal that I'm really the most afraid of when I'm observing in the dark and can't see anything, yeah. you know, you go outside the door and you don't know what you're stepping on. Our neighbor's cat was sprayed. He is 100 <laughs> meters away from my, my observatory. Was sprayed this week. So you know that uh, they're there. And uh, I haven't been sprayed yet, but I, I would imagine it's just a matter of time. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. But you know, seriously, in the dark and you're getting tired, the thing that really, really scares me 
is this fellow. <laughs> and you're not going to believe this or not, but uh, sometimes I'll be going back into the house from observatory and the adrenaline <laughs> rush I get when I think of vampires or werewolves or whatever. <laughs> uh, now, I really have to tell you that uh, if it's clear, I'm out observing, you know, uh, for, almost for sure. So um, I've been getting a lot of sleep this winter, summer. <laughs> Yeah, but my, actually my other hobby is golf. No, wait a sec, that's not good. So this is a picture of my observatory not very many days ago. And I, I would be remiss uh, if I didn't uh, mention my wife, Ginny, uh, for putting up with me all, these, uh, all this time with my observing and all the time it takes. And I tell you stories, but actually she's here tonight, so I'll save those for another talk. Now, I, 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 just before I finish, I really should tell you one other thing. Um, Brian gave a real nice talk about uh, uh, the Mars lander, and Richard Harding sitting beside me back there, and his comment was, the little scoop is going to go out and suck up a little Martian, and they're going to bake them in an oven, <laughs> and they're going to declare war on Earth. <laughs> that was excellent, Bob. Thank you. Now, looking at that, uh, that skunk, that reminds me that uh, Pam Wolf, Pamela Wolf, uh, uh, she w works at, uh, at Carleton University, but she's also one of the uh, astronomy educators here at the museum. And she told me about two years ago, she was walking down a darkened street in Canada, and uh, she felt this uh, kitty cat brush against her leg, right? So she reached down and was scrunching it under its ear and thinking, my goodness, this cat sure has a coarse, uh, coarse fur, a coarse hair on it, eh? And then she saw the, uh, the double stripe, and then a uh, nice kitty cat, nice little moufette, huh? All right. Okay, next up. Yes? Yes, no, yes. What's that? Nope, no, we'll, we'll do this first, yep. Okay, Mike, you ready to roll on your... Okay, so next up, uh, Mike Early's got some uh, uh, some images and a bit of an observing report. Come on up, Mike. A bit of an obser observing report on the uh, the two novae that were discovered in the constellation of uh, Ophiuchus, the serpent bearer. Mike. Okay, Mike. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Chris. Yeah, I don't have a with this. Okay, thanks a lot, Brian. Uh, I saw the first shot there was the. Uh, Shout out to the Nova, uh, Nova Ophiuchi, uh, 2008, uh, number one. Uh, about two months ago, uh, two, uh, Japanese astronomers found a, uh, a uh, Nova that was a, in our own galaxy that was approximately 10th magnitude uh, near the end of May, actually, they found it. And uh, about a week later, they found another one only about several degrees away from the first one. And uh, I thought that was a fascinating thing to have, two in the, almost the same part of the sky like that, which is, uh, I've always found it just an amazing coincidence. But uh, as you can see marked here is the uh, actual object. This is taken in color. And you can take a look at how red this is compared to the, all the other stars, mainly because it's uh, most likely much further away than any of these stars in the shot. Uh, most likely it's uh, tens of thousands of light years away. If anyone knows the actual distance, I haven't seen any, any published distances yet for this object, but it's very difficult to find because of the, uh, there are a lot of variables in it. Uh, the absorbing dust between here and there, uh, how bright the nova actually is, uh, so there, there, there are a lot of variables when, when, when thinking about this. Uh, I want to show you this first, actually. This is actually a spectrograph taken by a, uh, a one of the uh, discoverers. And you can see here that uh, anything past about this area, 7,000 angstroms, is uh, infrared. And anything uh, below 4,000 angstroms is ultraviolet. And anything in between is basically our spectrum, uh, purple to red. And you can see most of it is in the actually red part or infrared part of the spectrum. And that will be, uh, that, that's a very uh, critical uh, part about the, about part of what I'm going to be showing uh, tonight. So obviously it's a very red object, uh, as you can see here. This is taken on uh, the 22nd of June. Uh, I know the coordinates of these two objects off by heart now. I've been seeing this thing so many times over the past couple months. But of course, as Bob was alluding to, uh, I had a r real trouble observing these. Uh, I've only had about maybe 10 observations over two months, which is really bad, actually. <laughs> so this is a CCD image taken on one of the first days I looked at it. And you can see it's uh, quite bright here. The limiting magnitude of this shot is about 18, 18 or 19. Uh, and you can see that the optic is fairly bright. It's the brightest, one of the brightest objects in this shot. It was about 10th magnitude at the time. 
And cut to two months later, last night actually, and that's what it is, hardly dimmed. That's incredible. I mean, it, it's dimmed a bit, but not very much. Now let's cut to the second one. The second uh, one was discovered uh, at the very beginning of June, actually about three days before this shot was taken. And you can see here, it was a, quite a hazy night. As you can see, the stars are quite puffed out and there's not many stars. Something magnitude here is probably not even breaking 16. Uh, but you can see the star here, uh, it is quite, quite bright, 12th magnitude when it was discovered. And two weeks before, there was literally nothing on any of the uh, survey plates. So uh, I had originally thought that maybe this object was older than the first one and it was dimming down uh, when they found it. But this was actually one of the brightest uh, it had. Now cut to yesterday, last night, it's now about 18th magnitude. So. These two objects are amazingly different. Uh, the first one is taking a lot longer to dim, whereas the second one is, 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 has dimmed right down almost to below the noise uh, uh, just two months and just 60 days. So here's a little graph I had I made of all the, uh, as like I said, only about maybe 10 observations per, uh, per nova. It was just a terrible uh, summer, I must admit, but I did get some data from it. And uh, day zero is June 3rd. And day 59, that's yesterday, last night. I, I, I had an amazing uh, uh, stroke of luck in Brockville. It cleared up, and there were these clouds in the west. They were just sitting there, but they weren't getting any higher. The problem with these, these novae is they're only about 20 degrees above the horizon at, at highest. So when there's any clouds around, uh, they tend to gang up on these things quite quickly. So I wish there were some, some that are at, around Zenith. That would be nice. Uh, but these ones, unfortunately, were not in the cards for that. But you can see the difference between these two objects. This is amazing. As you see, this one here starts at 12 and, and just falls like a stone over two months. This one here basically sits, it dims a little bit, and it's still dimming a little bit. It's now sitting at about 11.6 uh, magnitude. But I'm, I'm basically say, seeing that uh, the infrared radiation may be the reason why this object looks much brighter than it actually is. This one could be pumping out a lot more infrared radiation than this one here. Uh, because I've seen some reports who, who have uh, taken in visual filters, uh, visual uh, spectrum filters, that they're, they're reporting about 13 and a half, 14th magnitude for this object, and I'm seeing 11 and a half. So I'm detecting the infrared radiation. Uh, my camera, you know, most CCD cameras uh, without uh, any, any, any special filters will just take infrared right in. The low bands, anyway, of infrared, so you can actually see it coming right in here. Hey, Gary. Just wondering on Nova 1 on day 32, right. night 32, right. I think it was a brighter for a bit of a time. Oh, uh, yeah, that's error. error. Yeah, it's just an error. It's, 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 I mean, I tried to, to, uh, to get it as, as accurate as to about 0.1 magnitude. I mean, this is a very small little change. Uh, normally what you do after the end is just have a trend line going down for each one. There, there, is, there are sources of error in this, of course, because you have, uh, you have different humidity for different days. You may have some cloud coming in uh, and temperature uh, as well. It's, uh, it can be uh, quite, uh, uh, quite different. Also, you may not get as many pictures. I mean, pictures you saw before were basically uh, shots that were resulted of stacking. And some I stacked 20 shots, some I stacked 50 shots. It depended on how many I could get before the clouds invaded. <laughs> it's like... It's like a minefield almost. You're like tiptoeing through it and all of a sudden, bang, it goes off and then you have to take <laughs> everything in. <laughs> so uh, is that the last one there? Oh, yeah. Yeah, one little announcement here. I, you, you kept it with us, so that's good. Uh, Emilio Quintale in Almont is hosting two star parties, uh, one on August 29th, the other one on September 26th at the Emilio Quintale uh, gate, Gatehouse uh, in Almont. Uh, you can go to uh, caster 2 ca slash parties and all the information is there, uh, location maps, weather maps, uh, when, near the day of course, and uh, I'm not that good. And uh, uh, special objects that you can see, we've got Jupiter, Uranus, and Neptune uh, all ready to go, so uh, uh, it's a free admission, all are welcome, tell your friends, uh, tell, tell your friends and family. Uh, you can train, if you have a parrot, train it to, to repeat it. If anyone walks in the door, they can just say it. Yeah, saves you time, you know. So, uh, that's it for that, and uh, I think I'm done. Okay, so that's the note. Any questions, you can, you can, you can you know, search me out afterward, and there's, there's a lot of questions about these two novae, so. Any questions for Mike here, on the, or comments on these? We'll applaud in a minute. <laughs> I can do we it. Will. I did have a question. He said sure. the, uh, it, it only appeared about 20 degrees off the horizon. Yeah. Um, are most novas 
Oh, they can go anywhere. They can be anywhere, basically. Some have been in Aquila, some have been in Hercules. I've heard a few reports of that, yeah. I mean, basically, I mean, statistically speaking, they can go, they can be pretty much anywhere, but in our own galaxy, in the disk, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, Novae, in our own disk of our own ga a galaxy, That's yes. Right. They are basically confined to that, that strip, but the Milky Way could be straight up, right? Cygnus. Yeah, right. yeah so. Okay, just keep saying. Mm -hmm. Yes? Uh, ten. Can you repeat the uh, question? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, uh, he was asking uh, how bright uh, Nova One got when it was first detected. Uh, it was about tenth magnitude when it was first detected. Uh, it didn't get any particularly get any brighter than that. But people have been predicting this one may actually get brighter. It may actually come back. Uh, but this was back a month ago, and I don't know if it's going to. I can't say. No one can say actually. <laughs> it's very. It's a very difficult. These things are, are, are almost totally unpredictable. They can be. They can start to come down, and all of a sudden, bang! They come. They they can be double as bright as they were when they were first detected. It's very. They're very interesting. Yes. Uh, how often are these nova being detected? Uh, how often? Yeah. Well, uh, it won't mean the ones in our own galaxy. Like are you seeing them a couple a year or? Well, they are they are totally random, but. You get a, yeah, I get a two or three a year, but uh, it depends on the brightness too. I mean, uh, the stars, the both novae that we saw, uh, we we never knew they existed. The stars we didn't even know they existed until just two months ago when they brightened up. See, that's why I'm thinking. That's why these stars are certainly tens of thousands of light years away because normally, you know, if they were any closer, you'd be able to see them or at least detect them on surveys down to twenty second magnitude. But uh, uh, it, it basically is a random event because we can't predict what's well, what's going to come in. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Uh, Paul? No. Uh, the, I know the, like the magnitude scale is not linear. It's sort of a logarithmic. Yeah. Right. Not 12 to 18? Can you explain what you're Oh, okay, saying? yes, yes, yes. Well, the magnitude scale is based on a uh, power of 2.512. <laughs> so uh, a difference of two magnitudes is 2.512 squared. Difference of five magnitudes is 2.512 to the fifth, which is 100. So it's approximately 250 times between 12 and 18. Yeah. All right. Okay, thank you, Mike. Okay, okay. no problem. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we're going to be breaking in just a moment, but just before we do, uh, uh, I'm very, uh, I'm, I'm thrilled that there's, a, we've got somebody very special in the room tonight. We have a, one of our newer members, Gordon Webster, uh, who's here this evening, and uh, the person I'm really, really happy to see tonight is Concepcion, his wife, who's been, uh, it's been the grand saga, uh, working, working with the Canadian government to come in from the, uh, from the Philippines, and uh, very happy to see you here, Shoni. So, welcome to Canada. Thank you. All right, so on the heels of that, if you don't have a ticket for the door prize uh, draw tonight, come get, a, come get a ticket. You don't have to be a member, as I mentioned, and no double dipping on the ticket box, all right? Uh, I know some of you guys. Waldy, I'm looking at you. We're into the observations. And I have my little uh, tokens here for people who give observing reports. Yeah. Uh, okay, what's up first? Rob. There have been clear nights. Some of them have been cool. Some of them have been very hot. And when they're hot, of course, there's lots of mosquitoes. So uh, there's this thing called a thermocell that was uh, promoted or reviewed in Sky News. I got one of those things. And by the way, they do work. Empties your pocket pretty quickly of money, but it works very well. But to save money, I figured I don't think I want to go out there. And so there, this is taken through the screen of the veranda of my cottage. Yeah. And uh, I must admit, it was great to see the mosquitoes swarming outside as I briefly just blew on the screen to entice them to get closer. <laughs> but it just shows the, uh, in particular, lots of trees are growing up in front of the cottage on, the, on, on purpose because of all the, the cottages that are now developing across the lake. And I, I wrote an article for the, the Rideau Valley Conservation Authority about light pollution, and within two weeks, Literally three quarters of the properties turn their lights out at night. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. Except for that one guy. 
And, but that's, as you can see, it's in the north, and whoever looks at the north, except to take a pretty picture. Anyway. I look for Santa there. <laughs> that's right. I do. Okay, if you have any questions uh, about that, uh, it's, it's uh, actually a, uh, took a little bit of work to make it look the way it looked to the eye. I, I do do that with these pictures. Uh, you can't exactly reproduce what you see with your eye, but you can, it doesn't take much work to make it look exactly the way it looked. That's the way the sky actually looks to my eye. The, the sky is pretty transparent out there. Rob, how did you shoot through the screen? The camera was about three inches from the screen. Out of focus. Uh, the, yep, the screen was out of focus. In fact, you look very closely at it, you'll see a little bit of patterning in it. Yeah. And that's from the screen. We were, we were wondering if we could have zoomed in on that, we could have seen the cross screen effect there. You'd see these, the stars would have the, uh, uh, the, the points coming off the top and the, the sides there. Oh, and it's a uh, Canon Rebel, uh, the, the second version, that's the 8 megapixel version. The 10 is a little too many pixels uh, for my computer anyway. And um, standard lens that came with the camera. You sure milked a lot out of one slide. Jeez. <laughs> Very good, thank you. Excellent. Thanks, Rob. Okay, Gary? Uh, thanks, sir. Just a couple of slides here tonight. Uh, Wednesday morning was very clear at uh, 10 minutes to 5, and uh, just opened up the, uh, the, the shade in the bedroom, and there was the moon, so I ran downstairs, snapped about three minutes before the clouds actually covered the moon. And again with the Canon Rebel XT, uh, with the regular uh, lens on it, 75 millimeters, five to second exposure at uh, ISO 100 on a tripod. So this is the star Mebdus, Meb, Mebsuda, and um, it's part of, the, uh, part of Gemini, which means then Orion is, is rising up early. We're in August now, so people that like Orion, well, it's a season of, of shoveling snow, um, it's almost upon us. And just some information about the star, which I have on one of my blog sites. So this star is actually 900 light years away. And in essence, it's uh, pretty large, 150 times the size of our sun. In fact, if you replaced it for our sun, it would take in the orbit of Venus. So it's quite large. And here's where she was in the sky. I was very surprised. And of course, that, that night, I think they called for thunderstorms and chance of thunderstorms, and it was a, just a clear sky. The weather forecasting has really been atrocious this year. I like uh, Granny Klamath's uh, weather beetle instead. Gary, just to repeat your point about Orion there. Really sure uh, yes, or, Orion on the, uh, on the far right-hand side. Orion is coming up soon, and I have no idea how this works. Okay, next slide. Okay. And while well, the processing of Jupiter is getting a little better, and a great segue for what Tim was saying on August 6th, 7th, when we have the transit of Io, uh, Tim mentioned it's going to be around 11, 11.30, and Jupiter is well placed in the sky for me, so I will be webcasting that night, astrocasting as I call it. And um, so those of you that do not have telescopes, if it's a clear night, get on your computers. Wondersofastronomy.com is my website, and there's a link to live Yahoo. And uh, let's hope for clear skies and uh, actually a beautiful transit across. Uh, who has seen it, with your applause, who has seen a transit? And who has not seen a transit? <laughs> eh, about half and half, so uh, so let's hope it's uh, clear that night. Gary, okay. Gary, I was just wondering, did you have uh, an improvement on the edges on that from last month's shot? Because you took one in the last month, and you said you were having problems on the edges. Uh, yes, uh, again, it, it's the settings with the uh, scroll bar settings when I first took the image off was was uh, excellent on some of the instructions. I had the, the brightness way up before, and I was getting these stupid rings around, yeah. so now I brought the brightness down about halfway, and now using the gain instead, and that made a huge difference. And also with the workshop that, that Rolf uh, graciously had at his house, uh, really helped with the processing. Now, Rolf has always said, use higher F ratio, F30, F20. I've tried, but turbulence is just so bad, this is uh, only at F10. I've tried higher, but just gets, uh, too fuzzy, you really can't see in detail. But at least we have the great red spot over here, which I'm pretty happy. Okay, thanks a lot, folks, and hope to see you online on August 6th. Great, excellent. Thank you, Gary. Paul, did you want to talk about that for a minute? No, it's just this is a, a good place to observe. It's in Volseculop. It's about a ninth magnitude object, and uh, I thought since it's, it's current, it's uh, nice to show something that is around these days. So a nice uh, ninth magnitude object in uh, Volpecula. That's the uh, M27, also known as the Dumbbell Cluster. All right? Nebula. Oh, Dumbbell Nebula, yes, Cluster Nebula. 
Uh, I was. Uh, you can't get away with mistakes in this group. I, I don't multitask well. Sorry. Uh. All right. Someone who's asking Paul a question. Oh, a question for Paul. Yes. What camera? Yeah. Uh, an ST10XME. Uh, he speaks in code riddle. I like that. Well, that that's the uh, Santa Barbara. Santa Barbara Instruments Group, S Big. Yeah, and I have a, a Mead 14 inch, and I'm using it at the uh, F6.3 with the 2x2 two two mini. All right, any other uh, comments or questions? Okay. Avancez. Thanks, Brian. I uh, have a, a, a few shots to, to this evening. I've been uh, playing around a little bit with uh, imaging. Uh, uh, and uh, I thought uh, show some interesting shots I took over the past couple months. Uh, this is a shot I took actually on uh, July uh, the, uh, the 1st, actually, the Canada Day, just before the uh, fireworks went off. Uh, this was the... Uh, this picture looks like almost like the sun's out, like, you're, like it's a nice summer day and there's a clear sky, a rare clear sky over the summer, but you can see this little thing right in here. This is an interesting effect when you, when you uh, or, or kind of overexpose with a, uh, a camera. This is a Nikon 4500 Coolpix I've had for several years. And you can see there's Jupiter right there coming up, uh, just rising at that time. But of course now, about a month later, it's going to be about up here uh, uh, at the same time. As Tim was alluding to last month, uh, actually he literally said it last month, uh, right, Tim? No. That's right. Okay. Uh, there was a nice uh, pairing of uh, conjunctions, actually several of them, over uh, over uh, several days on uh, July, was it July 4th, 5th, uh, and, uh, and, and 6th and 10th, I believe. And this is one of them. This is a, a nice triangle effect with the first crescent moon, uh, Mars, sorry, Mars, uh, Sat uh, Saturn, and uh, Regulus. And so it makes a nice little triangle effect right there. Not my, very much scientific value, but it makes you stop and smell the roses in astronomy a little bit. You know what I mean? It's a, it's a lovely. Moment. I'm sorry. It's a Kodak moment. It is a Kodak moment. You're right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I got this in Brockville. It was uh, had a nice, nice horizon in the west, so I thought to get this shot. And uh, you see the Earth shine there quite well. Yeah, and as Gary was alluding to in his uh, his, t his uh, observation talk there as well, the, the difference in the distances of each one of these objects. Like the Moon is about 385,000 kilometers, Saturn about a billion kilometers, uh, Regulus uh, too too large to to really count. 77 light years uh, would be more precise, and uh, and this star here is probably even further out than Regulus. So that's part of a uh, part of Leo as well, and this was taken just about maybe half an hour after sunset. Now, one great thing about living in Brockville is that you can see the fireworks on the 1st and the 4th. <laughs> <laughs> and this was a shot taken across St. Lawrence of Jupiter and fireworks going off in uh, Morristown, which is near Ogdensburg. And uh, you can see, I like this effect here. You can already see the red on the water. And, uh, but sometimes the juxtaposition of, uh, of celestial objects and, and terrestrial objects makes a nice uh, pairing. That's Homeland Security trying to shoot down Jupiter? Probably. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, and, and there's a message after that they message uh, sends them stay away from Europa. <laughs> Another they shot go of. Uh, else, though. Yeah, exactly. That's true, and that's the problem. Yeah. And here is a shot again of the fireworks just down here in Morristown, and here's Scorpius coming in as well, and uh, you know just a yeah. What's happening with Delta Scorpii these days? Yeah, these days. Well, it was what five years ago I started doing that, something like that. It started getting brighter, and it's just it's staying there. No one knows why. It just happened to brighten up, and it's not dimming down any time. It's. I remember when all three of these stars were basically nearly the same brightness, right? Yeah. And all of a sudden, Delta came up and said, "Nope, I want to be different." <laughs> so. Can you tell us about the uh, the reddish one in the middle? Of the uh, right here. Yeah. Well, that's Antares. That's the uh, brightest star in uh, in Scorpius. The heart, basically the heart of the Scorpion. Uh, Scorpius is one of those constellations that amazingly actually look like the, the, uh, the name they're trying, to, uh, they're trying to describe. Like Scorpius, a scorpion, you can see these are claws right here, and you can see it goes all the way down, and there's a little tail like this, so it actually looks like a scorpion, which is amazing to me. I mean, most of the constellations, like, like Canis Minor, for instance, you know, it's a wiener dog or something. I don't know what that was <laughs> to be there. <laughs> it's a balloon dog. A balloon dog. Oh, yeah, that's good. But it has no head. 
that's if you know if somebody doesn't know how to do it yet. Oh, Antares? I don't know, actually. But, but I think Antares, Antares goes out to, over to Mars, does it not? Uh, Antares? Yeah. 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 About that. Yeah, about, yeah. About, about the size of uh, the orbit of Mars. It's, it's roughly the same size. Yeah, it's basically what happens when a star uh, starts losing, uh, losing fuel. It starts to, uh, actually starts to balloon up a few times. And then you get basically what's called a red giant. And this is basically a red giant star. Uh, and that one's a red supergiant. Is it a supergiant? Yeah, okay. That one's a super giant. Yeah, or, or Mars. Uh, not surprised. Uh, this, which is the star that got brighter? Uh, this one right here. Delta. Delta Scorpio, right there. That's the one that got brighter. She's no longer the fourth brightest. <laughs> right, exactly. That's the thing, yeah. What do you do with those uh, nomenclatures when yep. the, uh, yeah. Well, I can't we, predict we that. The charts. Yeah, it's like 34 Tori. That was Uranus, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, moved. <laughs> it's gone. 35 Tori. 36 Tori. Yeah. <laughs> okay, here's another shot of the fireworks down here. It's kind of, it became kind of boring, I know. And there's Jupiter right there, and you can see, start seeing Sagittarius, which is over in the edge right here, but it was kind of very hazy, as you can see here, but uh, yeah, but the stars up here you could really see very well, so they started getting a little better. I actually got this object. I, I was promising myself to get this object for how, God knows how long, and I finally said, okay, I'm going to do it. So I'm amazed that today you can actually get the tail of these things. This one here is a little dimmer, but you can actually get the tails of the ring tail now with backyard telescopes, which is absolutely phenomenal to me. I remember as a kid seeing these amazing, you know, observatory shots of these uh, of these amazing objects, and you couldn't get them with an eight-inch scope and a, a thirty-five millimeter unless you really had a lot of uh, a lot of patience and a huge amount of. Uh, 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 ch chemicals, as it were, to push the film and so on and so on. But uh, with a CCD camera and 11 inch telescope, you can actually get it. And this, you know, the ring tail is not one of these objects that are straight up. At Zenith, these, this object's about maybe 25, 30 degrees in, in, in Corvus, basically. That's where the, uh, the, the object's located. I, I always think that looks like a shrimp or something. It actually looks like a little shrimp. And that's the first thing you see. And then you start stacking the shots, you start seeing the tail come in, which is absolutely amazing. Now, this is a, uh, uh, what I like to do sometimes is to take uh, my wide field, uh, uh, it's basically a 35 millimeter uh, camera, uh, uh, 50, a 50 millimeter lens for a 35 millimeter camera, and to fit it on my CCD camera and take shots of, uh, of star, star uh, 12 by 12 degree images of the sky. And this is one of them of the constellation of Sagitta, the arrow. And there it is right there. And it's hard to, to p pick it out uh, without the uh, without the visual aids, thank you, Chris. Without the visual aids, but this guy right here looks a little fuzzy. That is M71, and I, I think it's amazing at a 12 by 12 degree field of view, you can actually still see M71, and, uh, which is not the brightest of globulars in the sky either. But in the Milky Way, you can see it coming through here, and which is pretty interesting. The limiting magnitude of this shot is about 10, so I could have. And it's possible for me to discover Novae in the Milky Way uh, because of that last one, that first one was magnitude 10 when it was discovered. So it was, it's possible using a blink comparator and the several images of the sky, I could probably get uh, something like that if I had the patience to do it. Yeah, where is it? Oh yeah, that's true. That is very cool. Yeah. So if, if you get a CCD camera, put a, like a, a low, a very low, uh, uh, like a wide field, uh, 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 lens on it. It's just amazing what you can see with it. Hey Mike, it yeah. looks like you got M27 up there too. M27, really, where? Uh, small. Up I think top left. Top yeah, left. Up in here? Right, right there? Right there. Right there. Yeah, it could yeah. be. I remember getting the Whirlpool with this, and it was like you can see the two components. You can actually see them they're very close together. You can actually see the two components, which is, I'm saying it's a phenomenal thing to do these days. Okay, so remember about M27. Mm -hmm. All right, well, we had uh, Paul's. Uh, right. That's going to be coming up as one of the uh, observing challenges. So, M27? Yeah. I didn't think it was M27. What's that? It wasn't M27. We're, we're, we're doing two. Oh, okay, fine. Yeah, yeah, okay. And another great thing about CCD cameras is they can really pick out that Milky Way. Uh, this is the Sputum star cloud right here. And you can see all oh, its glory. Unfortunately, you know, it's not color. Well, you know, it, it actually, a, a black and white one's more sensitive. So, you know, it's, it's, it's good to pick this out. This shot was about 30 seconds exposure. Yeah, I know they do. Yeah. Well, yeah, I, mine's guided. You can do that. That's true. And uh, but 
I like taking shots just, you know, 30 seconds, a minute. So it's guided. Basically, I piggyback the, uh, the wide field onto the, my 11-inch uh, telescope. I just let it guide through the thing. And uh, it's centered basically on, this is M11 right here, the wild duck cluster. I mean, you can't see every individual star. Of course not. But uh, uh, it looks like a duck. It doesn't, that doesn't it? Now, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think it was like a drunken admiral will name that one or something, right? It had to be. Oh, yeah, well, actually it was Baby Duck. Baby, baby Duck, duck right. <laughs> yeah, Baby Duck. <laughs> one, uh, another galaxy I really wanted to get was the Sunflower. It's, just, it's kind of challenging because you have all these really, really mottled areas here and you really want to get that uh, detail in there. I took about 100 shots of it and stacked them up. Uh, it's basically Registax did this. And uh, the stars are not bad. Uh, this is almost at zenith, so the limiting magnitude here is about, I'd say, 18 and a half, somewhere in that area. And one thing I like to do once in a while is just uh, point the scope right at zenith, take a huge amount of images, and see how far down I can get, uh, the limiting magnitude, how far I can get. The so far, I've gotten about 20. I'm sorry? The mic deep field? Mic deep field, right. <laughs> uh, it's. Uh, so far, I've been able to get about 20, down to 20th magnitude, but wow. I can hardly, I can't really push it down any further than that. And I'm using large, I'm using a large uh, pixel resolution. I'm at about 1.56 arc seconds, because you know my primary is not taking lovely high resolution images; it's satellites. So uh, you got to be able to detect satellites which are moving across the array. This is like a little galaxy UGC 0, uh, 9703. L nice little structure in there, though. I mean, it's like a nice little edge on galaxy, probably a spiral, but. It's, uh, that could be a good uh, uh, a challenge, uh, a challenge object. object. I don't know if you can actually see it through the uh, through an eyepiece, but uh, uh, it's, not, it's not much. Uh, it's probably not much worse than Hickson 61. Right? <laughs> That's a nice one. I love this one. I took this shot. I said, you know, just picked it totally at random. I said, hey, I'm going to look at this one. I didn't. Wow, look at that. You know, you can see this nice little. Every single galaxy is totally different when you take a look at them, aren't they? I mean, it's just you can see, and and just imagine how far out this guy is. You know, we're talking probably about 100 or 200 million uh, light years away. Something in there could be looking at our Milky Way and saying, wow, look at that, you know, uh, which is absolutely incredible. And uh, you just see at 10627. Here's a nice little spiral as well. You can actually see little spiral arms on the, you see 10845. Uh, you just take a whole bunch of shots, stack them together, and you basically get a signal rising above your noise floor and that's randomizing your noise. So you get a nice popping out of the detail here. And uh, I, just, I just love doing that from time to time, you know, when I'm bored or something and I'm you know, not many mosquitoes around, at least. I get my work done fast. I said, okay, I'll take another shot of something else, you know, just see what it looks like. And that's it. And that's my observing for the month. And I'm surprised I got that much. <laughs> so this is basically the first astrophoto I took with this camera. I, mean, I took a few test shots before, but <clears throat> um, my first digital SLR. Oh, I'd like to thank uh, Bob Olson for um, uh, some advice on uh, the histograms for uh, adjusting the, uh, the colors and brightnesses and so on on this. Bob, of course, is uh, much, much more proficient at this kind of uh, photography. Uh, I guess I should say what this object is, um, although <laughs> probably most people have guessed it's the North American Nebula. And uh, uh, 20 minutes, but it's five uh, five minute exposures, four of them stacked. And uh, let's see what else can I say about that. Point out the pelican there, uh, there's a pointer. Oh, yeah, there's, uh, there's a pointer there. I'm supposed to point out the pelican. Uh, it's this, it's this I way. barely know what that is. It's right there. I think it's this. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I mean, there's better pictures uh, of this. Well, so I'll probably take more pictures over time and stack them, but. Uh, 20 minutes was all I could take. Oh yeah, uh, the other thing was that this is with just the um, zoom lens that came with the camera, but it's a little bit cropped, so it actually shows quite a bit more in the in the full field. But this is cropped; so it's about a third of the of the whole frame. And you're in Cygnus there, right? Yeah, that's just about pointed straight up, and um, on one of the few clear nights we've had, I guess. Uh, First that's it. Uh, next uh, slide. Uh, so this is Jupiter again on one of the few uh, fairly decent nights we've had. And again, um, I did apply some of the uh, ideas that uh, Bob Olson had on uh, the histograms because I found that 
the program that came with my Canon camera uh, actually has a pretty good program for doing um, adjusting the histograms, uh, and it was free. That was the, that was the main thing. Free with a two thousand dollar camera, but uh, <laughs> anyway. Um, so that, uh, but that, but that way, I was able to get the, the color balance very accurately. So I know how to do that now. So, and uh, that's it. I don't know. Any questions on this picture? Oh yeah, the uh, yeah the red spot. So the red spot is just uh, peeking out here. I think it was just going off the disc at the time. Uh, very difficult to get uh, any decent uh, images of Jupiter this year because it's very low, mm -hmm. about uh, twenty degrees up, I guess. So. There aren't any shadows on there, are there, of any of the moons? No. No, no shadows. Uh, these little spots are just spots. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Thank you, Ralph. Please put it Yeah. Um, I've, I've always wanted to, to see a quasar. And so when uh, Attila came up with the idea of a double, the double quasar, I, I actually listened to it at the meeting and then went home and forgot all, I forgot what he had said. Uh, which is not like me in Attila, because I normally remember every word he says. But I forgot what he said, so I had to actually send him an email and ask him, what did you talk about? And so he sent me the coordinates of this again. And um, what you're looking at is right there. That's the double quasar that's being gravitationally lensed by a galaxy in between us and it. And those quasars are 8 billion light years away. Uh, I think... The galaxy is somewhere halfway between us, they think. And if it, just to re reiterate what uh, Attila said is that the spectrums of the two are the same. So we know they're the same object. And that the light path of one is about a year and a half longer than the light path of the other. So, you know, when one wiggles, it, the other one wiggles a year and a half later. So we're pretty confident that those are, double, those are quasars, uh, the same one. Uh, anyway, the galaxy is something around 14 billion light years across. So this is, uh, I have to admit, uh, uh, even though the image is not very good, it's, uh, it's, uh, I was very excited to take this picture. Uh, I should tell you that those quasars, I think, are six arc minutes apart. And I took something like 30 images, and I, uh, the separation, they only resolved in about maybe half a, a dozen of them. And so then I stacked that dozen. So it's basically 12 images, four minutes long. So. That's how many Im Im images were used to get this uh, final result. Anyway. Oh, what magnitude was that quasar? I forget. No idea. Sorry. What was the question? What's the, what's the magnitude of it? I don't know. Sorry. I was, uh, I, you know, I read all that when I was researching it to find out where this thing was and how to, what it was doing. Uh, and uh, when, uh, in my individual images, I could see separation on just some of the images. Uh, my camera resolves typically about <clears throat> three arc minutes accurately. So this was pushing the limits of my equipment. Okay. Okay, here we get into our challenges for, uh, for this month. Mike, you wanna talk about this guy? Sure. Thanks, Brian. In desperation, Brian came to me and wanted an object. So Did I look I said, like yeah, I yeah, you're desperate. Yeah, Mike, I gotta get an object. Please, please help me. <laughs> anyway, uh, this is uh, during the raffle break. That's what it was. Yeah, it was during the raffle break. Yeah, yeah. He, so, anyway, uh, this is a challenge object. Uh, in fact, it's not entirely a, 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 a um, what I call a a challenge. Not in the sense of Hickson Fifty One, like some of the Tills picks are. But uh, I thought I'd make it easier on people with by picking this one instead. And this is uh, NGC 5907 and Draco. Uh, this is a nice, the only problem with this galaxy, the reason why it can be considered a challenge is because it is quite edge on. And anyone who's visually observed a galaxy nearly edge on can attest that it's, it's quite difficult to see. Uh, not the ones that are closer like NGC 891 in Andromeda, but this one here uh, can be seen with an eight inch scope uh, in a fairly dark sky with a, with a say, uh, uh, 30 arc minute uh, field of view, uh, IP 30, 30 arc minute field of view or so. Uh, those who've done uh, the deep sky, sorry, the, uh, the finest NGC, I think this is one of them. Uh, it is a nice object. If you can, you, when you pick it out, of course, averted vision works best with this kind of object. And when you look at it, uh, try to see something that's almost like a needle on its side. And that's exactly what you see. Uh, 
but it, it makes it a very a, kind of a challenging object for those with smaller scopes. I wouldn't recommend it with anything less than eight inch though. Maybe a six inch, you might do it in a really dark sky, but other than that, what like I said, Draco. Yeah. I remember seeing that one in the early 90s uh, when I was on a galaxy kick, uh, looking at uh, all the galaxies I could possibly get with an old Criterion 8 inch. But, uh, it's, uh, but I did get it with it, so if I can get it with a Criterion, you can get it with one today, because the Criterions were not known for their superior optics. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh yes, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm going to steal it on you. Yeah. All right. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Draco, Draco, of course, is a constellation that snakes between the two dippers in the northern sky. All right. Uh, the other uh, deep sky challenge. Uh, we try to have a couple of levels of challenge uh, for for objects. And uh, Paul talked about uh, uh, M27, the uh, dumbbell nebula, right? Okay. And that's in the constellation of Volpecula, Volpecula the the fox. All right. After the fox, there it is, M27. About ninth magnitude. About ninth magnitude. Now for... Uh, uh, As you can see in a small scope, you don't need a big scope. Either. Right, so a small scope is all that's required for sure. Like binoculars. Even. Binoculars, yeah. yes, if you have a dark sky, a good sky for sure. Um, if you're looking for finder charts for either M27 or NGC 5907, 5907. 5907 uh, if you Google the, those numbers, uh, you'll get lots of information there and uh, we, we didn't uh, put up finder charts for them tonight. All right, so lunar challenge. Now I picked this. This is Gary's uh, Gary Boyle's uh, image. All right, so he's taking a nice <coughs> excuse me. He's taking a lovely photograph of the moon placed against uh, Mebsuta, a, a relatively bright star alongside it. So uh, for the challenge, this is just pretty picture challenge. Who else can come up with uh, a nice image of the moon alongside a bright object? Notice I didn't say what kind of a bright object. Right? So it, it, celestial and or slash otherwise. All right, so uh, if you want to have a bit of fun with something there, go for it, okay? All right, some basic information there, all right? But this is, this is all blah, blah stuff. Let's, let's move on here. 89, 89 of us stalwarts here tonight. All right, here we are. Uh, the observatory is closed tonight. We, we don't have an educator assigned from the museum tonight, so we can't open up the observatory. Uh, Stamont Library, uh, Estelle, you're here, right? Yeah, I'm here. Okay, so Estelle will be opening up the uh, observatory, which will be just on. Uh, <laughs> you made that same mistake last month. Did I? <laughs> yeah, you did. Oh well, let's stop. Stop taping this then and catch me on my mistakes. All right, the library, of course, the lab, the library is just on the other side of the wall, right here. Okay, uh, loan equipment library, uh, Al Scott, uh, he can uh, set you up with. Uh, we have some loaner telescopes and that. Uh, okay. Uh, C. Art Fraser for membership cards, but not tonight. He's away, and uh, Linda Meyer is, uh, is helping out in the back. She's uh, got uh, drinks and cookies set up there, and a little uh, donation pot there. Okay, and oh, it's, oh, it's already marked. Geez, you're quick. Hey, he taps all this stuff in. It's fantastic. Okay, and an important note, as always, the museum itself is closed uh, on our meeting night, so we don't have access to, uh, to the Crazy Kitchen and all the other good exhibits, okay? And if we go on... All right, so our next meeting is going to be Friday, September 5th. All right, but we can find that easily enough. It's always, usually the first Friday, it's always the first Friday of the month. But the photo I want to show you is, Oh no! go for it. There's Chris Heron, and that's his daughter, Briar, who just got married on July 26th. So if you pass uh, She's been Briar, meetings for years here. That's right, if you pass. But they run, some of them run off the university, and this is what they catch. This is what happens. <laughs> So if you pass her our uh, congratulations on her, on her marriage, what's your, what's your hubby's name? Hmm? What's your husband's name? Craig Dent. Craig Dent? All right. Okay, so congratulations to the both of them and uh, looking good. Hey, looking very nice. <laughs> now, is, I have to ask, is Linda, Linda, are you here? Can somebody step out and ask Linda to come in, please? I told her I'd show her this photo. Can you go back to that, please? Can't, can't run off and then we'll, we'll scoot out in just a second here. Is she coming? Linda certainly knows Briar. She knows Briar, yes. Okay, th Linda, there's the photo. I was telling you about that. Yeah, so there's Briar on her wedding day. Is she still smiling? <laughs> 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 All right, uh, can we bring the lights up, please, uh, Tim? All right, so if anybody has any questions for anybody, you can talk to us out in the lobby. We've got some drinks and that. And uh, usual last line, I, I love you all, but now shove off. Yes, yes. <laughs>
Thank you, Sailor.